Good afternoon, everyone. This is a short introduction to the Pali Kachayana grammar, a historical background, terminology, and technique. This is the first of six lectures. Before we start, I would like to, to thank the organizers, the organizers of this series, uh, especially Professor Kate Crosby. So before uh, we start, I would just like to say that in the during the live lecture, we had some technical problems and the first part of the of the lecture was not recorded so what i'm doing now is a uh, re-recording what more or less what we have seen i will try to be brief but not to forget anything that we saw in the first session so we basically started by looking at the files that i have uploaded in the on google drive in the file that in the folder that we share for this course this is a little bit of bibliography that we can use, but it's not it's not compulsory. The the lectures are standalone. One can follow the course just by watching the videos or attending the lectures. Uh, nevertheless, I will be referring to some publications or to some texts, and I I would say this is the basic bibliography to follow the course. Uh, I will also be uploading the slides, as you can see. So these are already the slides of the first lecture that took place last week. I have uploaded the Sandy section that is found in Olepin's critical edition uh, published by the PTS in 2013. That's so far, I would say, the best edition of the Kachayana grammar. Uh, it has a very interesting and very rich critical apparatus with notes and references to Panini, Katantra, etc. I have also uploaded a very good reference book for the Indian grammatical literature by uh, Sharfa. I have uploaded also a PhD thesis from 1997. It's actually very rare uh, work. I discovered it recently. It contains a translation of the Kachayana grammar together with very uh, erudite notes based on the commentarial tradition by this venerable scholar Tiap Malai from Thailand. But the thesis was uh, done in, in the University of Pune in India. Uh, I have also included Bikun and Dicena's English translation of the Kachana. This is again a rather rare text that is now up, uh, online, accessible online through the in, in, Instituto de Estudios Budistas Hispano. Uh, it's, it's in English actually and it was circulating in photocopies in Myanmar before but now it's accessible for everyone officially online. Uh, it's a very good translation, recent, 2017. Then from 2016, we have the more or better known uh, publication, uh, Kachayana Pali Grammar, in two volumes by Venerable Utitana. That's again a very useful tool for beginners. Then we have my review of this book, published in 2018. This review is mostly interesting or relevant here, not because of the review itself, it's because it includes uh, a general overview of, of Kachayana scholarship or rather scholarship on the Kachayana grammar so it you can use it as a bibliography if you wish and then I have also included uh, Emile Senard French translation together with the first edition of the text in Europe uh, that that was the the edition that was used in in Europe or English speaking uh, sorry in in the regions where uh, French was understood that means Euro Europe and other places till recently actually that was considered the European edition till 2013 when Olepin replaced it and actually Olepin's edition is partly based on Senat edition so it is a very uh, important publication perhaps it's just a bit of an archaeological piece here but it's important to, to have it, to consider it uh, perhaps the most important publication that I have shared is this article published by Olepin in the Journal of the Paritech Society 2012, more or less as a prelude to his critical edition. This is actually a, re, a revised version of another article that was published in, mid, in the mid-90s in Japan. That article was perhaps not accessible to many scholars, so it was great uh, for the PTS to republish it and with, with minor but important, I mean, um, uh, small but important changes and improvements. So I would say that if you have to select one publication among all of these publications to read, to have a general idea uh, of what is the Kachina, I would read this one. I would recommend this one, definitely. 
then again another archaeological piece is Vidya Busana's uh, English translation, which is mostly based on Senat. And then I have included a couple of Pali texts taken from the tipitaka.org website, which is nothing but the Burmese edition of the Sixth Council. In this case, of the of gra two important grammatical texts. One is, of course, the Kachayana Vyakarana with the commentary, and the other one is the Rupa Siddhi or Pada Rupa Siddhi, which is a 12th century recast or remake of the Kachayana. Now, without further ado, let us begin with the first session of the short introduction to the Pali Kachayana grammar. So, before we start, I would like to uh, remind the audience or kindly remind the audience that this is an introduction and as the title says it's a, it's a short introduction so I I won't have time to explain all the details and the the main goal of this introduction in, in six sessions is to not to teach the Kachina grammar but to prepare the students who already know Pali for the reading of the Kachina that means um, contemporary students students or scholars who are not familiar with the Indian methods of teaching grammar or studying grammar or analyzing language, in other words. So in here my intention is to, to provide a kind of overview or to explain a little bit how this grammar works so that when, when the student or a scholar will begin uh, with the reading of the Kachina, it will not look so strange or so awkward or impos basically impossible to understand. It's definitely a very particular style, very interesting in itself, and that's what we are going to to study or to to look at in, during these lectures. So, in the first session, we are going to to see a historical overview of the Kachina grammar, and then we are going to see how how is the Kachina based on Sanskrit grammars. Third, we are going to see the structure of the Kachina grammar. And fourth, the different types of rules. This last section, I would say, is the most important one. If that one is clear, then the next session will be easy to follow. So we begin with a historical overview. If we look at the Pali grammatical traditions, we have basically three main treatises. The Kachina, which is anonymous, although it's generally or traditionally ascribed to Mahaka China, the disciple of the Buddha. But there are many reasons to believe that that is not possible, so it's usually dated to the 6th century common era, and it was probably composed in India. Then next comes the treatise of Moggallana called the Moggallana Vyakarana, or Moggallana Grammar, by Moggallana, which uh, was a 12th century scholar from, from Lanka, from Sri Lanka. And if you want to know a little bit more about the, the, con the historical context of this grammar, I, w I will simply refer to Alistair Gornall's presentation uh, lecture in this same series. You can watch the video for an introduction and, and then read his book, uh, Rewriting Buddhism. And finally, another important or uh, fundamental Pali grammatical treatise is Agavamsa Sadhaniti, composed around the 12th or 13th century common era in Pagan or Bagan in, in present day Myanmar. Uh, some scholars consider that basically the Kachayan and the Mughalan are the two main classical grammars. Uh, the reason being that most of the or all the, the other grammatical texts are based on them. We are of course talking about extant or surviving grammatical treatises. There were others before the Kachayana, but they have not survived. So among the grammatical treatises that we have, the two or three classical grammars are these three or two, these two, Kachayana and Mongolana. I'm of the opinion that these are the two classical grammars. The Sadhaniti is mostly based on the Kachayana with much improvement, but still uh, it, it is uh, indebted to the Kachayana. And I call them classical polygrammars instead of indigenous polygrammars or traditional polygrammars because I think the word indigenous doesn't, or, or doesn't tell us anything. I think every writer of a Pali grammar, whether they are born in Germany or in Myanmar, they are indigenous of their own land, so the word indigenous doesn't mean anything here. And the same goes for traditional Pali grammars. So of course the Kachayana is a traditional Pali grammar, so is Geiger's grammar. Uh, every grammar that one writes 
is uh, embedded in a tradition. So I prefer to call them classical polygrammers and classical in the sense of uh, modelic being a model. So these two grammars are models for the other polygrammers. Now, uh, when it comes to the predecessors, or the yeah, predecessors of the Kachina polygrammer, those grammars that provide materials uh, for the Kachina to be built, so to say, the earliest extant materials or treatises are called the Pratishakya treatises. They deal with Vedic phonetics, that means mostly the pronunciation of Vedic texts, the recitation of Vedic texts, and they were composed more or less roughly uh, around the 6th century before the Common Era. Some of them probably uh, have earlier materials or they work with earlier materials. Um, some of these treatises are actually later than the 6th century before Common Era, but we do have some treatises that date to more or less to that period. And, and we find uh, these materials in the Kachina too. Next comes Panini's Ashtadiyai, uh, Ashtadiyai, sorry, the Eight Lessons, uh, composed around the 5th or 4th, 4th century before the Common Era in Shalatura in northwest India. This is the most famous grammar in, in India and one of the most famous in the world. It has been very influential even in contemporary linguistics or modern linguistics. Specifically, I'm thinking of uh, Noam Chomsky's uh, theories of generative grammar and so on. Uh, but in India, of course, Panini's grammar is the most important one. Uh, it's the most difficult one, too. Very complex, very inter interesting treatise. And the Kachina draws on Panini uh, for many of, the, many of the rules, actually. It can be traced back to Panini. But most importantly, we have the Katantra Vyakarana, ascribed to some Brahmin called Sharva Varman, that was composed around the second century common era. Again, we, the, the dates and authorships are actually provisional. This is what the tradition says, and this is what I believe makes sense from, our, uh, from the knowledge that we have at this moment. But it could be earlier, it could be... I think it could be earlier, maybe not later. But the Katantra Vyakarana that we have is definitely one of the models of the, of the Kachina. And the Kachina uh, was composed, as I said, more or less in the around the 6th century common era. And then we have the Kachina Vutti, which is a gloss or short commentary that explains the, the rules of the Kachina Vyakarana in a very clear manner. And both the Kachina Vyakarana and Kachina Vutti uh, more or less are correlated to the Katantra Vyakarana and the Katantra Vrutti, which must, must of course be earlier than, than, than them respectively, so the Kachana Vyakana is based on the Katantra and the Kachana Vutti is based on the Katantra Vrutri, uh, mostly, so we believe that the Kachana Vutti must be later than the Katantra Vrutti. But here we are dealing specifically with the Kachana Vyakarana, and that was composed around the 6th century common era. And when we are discussing the transmission of the Kachana Vyakarana, we cannot forget that this text has been studied in oral settings and using oral methods, but it still has been transmitted in a written format on palm leaves. This is a palm leaf manuscript of the Kachana and Kachana Vutti with the Burmese clause. There are, of course, Kachana manuscripts in, in Sri Lanka, in Sinhalese script, in Thailand, in Thai script, in, in Laos, etc. So this is how it has been uh, transmitted on a uh, material material form and if you go to monastic collections you will always find Kachan manuscripts it is possible that in some maybe remote monasteries they do not own a uh, full collection of the Tipitaka so maybe they don't have the entire Tiganikaya or all the Nikayas or all the, the books of the Tipitaka but surely everywhere you will find Kachan manuscripts because the Pali grammar had to be learned everywhere so this is this is in the manuscript tradition that that's one of the most common manuscripts that you find is the Kachina grammar. Now the question arises: How is the Kachina based on Sanskrit grammars? What we have seen before is that, of course, we take for granted that the Kachina uses earlier materials from Sanskrit grammars. That is something that more or less everyone knows. But the question is: How how does this happen? To what extent the materials used by Kachina 
are the same or are different or are manipulated. So we can start by comparing the Kachina and the Pratishakyas. Here what we see is the first rule of the Taitiriya Pratishakya, Atta Varna Samam Nayaha, then the first rule of the Katantra, Siddho Varna Samam Nayaha, and then the first rule of the Kachina, Atto Akarasanyato. You can see that there are some similarities. Let us forget about the meaning, but simply look at the shape of the sounds of the letters, and actually you can see that there are many similarities. Also, if you take into account that Akkara and Varna are synonymous, or Varna and Akshara are synonymous, they mean the same, you could replace Akkara for Varna in Pali, and that would be the, exactly the same meaning. So you could say Atto Varna Sanyato. And you see the similarity between the Taitiriya Pratishakya and the Kachana. Although, of course, the meaning of Atta and the meaning of Atto is different. It's very different. But I believe, and I don't have time here to go into details, that the Taitiriya Pratishakya 1 1 Atta Varna Samam Naya is the model, the original model for Kachina 1. Although, for uh, reasons that I cannot explain here, the meaning and basically the shape of the of Kachina 1 had to be changed. And actually, then this rule was, this rule was not ascribed to Kachina himself, but the tradition, or some traditions say that this Kachina 1, the first rule, the opening of the Kachina, was spoken by the Buddha himself. Another, another case of, uh, in this case, this similarity between the, the Pratishakya and the Kachina, so we can see that it doesn't follow the Pratishakyas all the time, is this rule, which more or less is the same in the Sanskrit tradition and in, in Kachina. But of course, there are some adjustments that need to be made, this is about the vowels, the Swaraha in Sanskrit or Sara in Pali. There are eight in Pali and they are 14 according to the Katantra and they are 16 according to the Pratishakya. But here you can see that the, the formulation of Katantra and Kachina is very close. Not so with the Taitiriya Pratishakya. So you cannot say that the Kachina is following the Taitiriya Pratishakya. Again, another case where the Kachina is again similar to the Taitiriya Pratishakya is uh, Taitiriya Pratishakya 1 6, uh, Shesho Vyanjanani, and Kachina 6, Sesa Vyanjana, compared with Katantra 119, Kadini Vyanjanani, which is the corresponding rule, it's not worded in the same way, whereas the Pratishakya and Kachina are exactly the same. What about Kachina and Panini? We can see many similarities, but uh, sometimes it's not exactly the same formulation. For instance, in this case, in Panini 2.3.18, you have Kartru Karana Yos Tritiya. And in, in the Kachina, you have this rule broken broken up in, into two. Here you have Kachina 2.2.88 and 2.90. One is, so one, in 2.90, you have Kattaricha, that means Kartaricha in the locative, that corresponds to Kartru. And then in 2.88, Karane, that is the Kara. Karana in the Panini, and then Tatiya, Tritiya. So that's how basically the same materials are used, but they are formulated and arranged slightly differently. Another example where there is a rule that you could trace from Kachina back to Panini, but the, the formulation is not exactly the same. You can see that there are some words that are similar. In this case, Panini, both Panini and Kachina are teaching us about the use of the particle of pratyaya or pachaya na. And so in, in that sense, they are same. You can also see the word shraddha or saddha in Pali. In Pali, actually says saddha dito, so it means uh, after the word saddha, etc. So this etc. could include also the words that are mentioned in the Sanskrit rule. But you see that there are clear similarities, one cannot deny them. But it is not that the Kachina simply takes the rule of Panini unchanged and unaltered. Now, when it comes to the Kachina and the Katantra, uh, there are even more similarities. There are also similarities in structure that we don't have time to review here. But I, I can just uh, say it now that the, the, the main structure of the Katantra and the Kachina are, are similar, not so with the, with the Kachina and Panini. Uh, and then there are some rules that are exactly the same, like this one, that is Katantra 2.5.1, the beginning of the section on compounds, Samasa. 
it says nam nam samasa yuktarta yuktarta and the china 317 says namanam samasa yuttato it's in pali but it's basically the same uh, this is a bit from my thesis where, where i actually studied the samasa section of the china in some commentaries and you can see that indeed the china the first rule on compounds by china is based on the katantra here I'm using the numeration, the complete numeration, the Katantra, Nam Nam Samasa Yuktartaha. But this rule in Katantra belongs to a stanza. It's part of a verse. So you could continue reading uh, in a versified way, in a metrical manner or prosodical manner. Nam Nam Samasa Yuktartaha, Tatstalo Pya Vivaktaha, Prakritis Cha Swarantasya, Vyanjanantasya Yat Supohu. So, but in Kachina, you don't find the same the same arrangement. Of course, the the materials are taken almost verbatim from the Katantra, but not in a metrical way. The f the first rule of compounding about compounds in the Kachina is Namanam Samaso Yutato. Then the, the next one is Tesam Bivatio Lopa Cha. So this Cha breaks the meter. Uh, it's not even in, in a metrical form in Kachina, so it doesn't matter. And then the, the third one, 320, Pakati Cha Sasarantasa, that corresponds to Prakritis Cha Swarantasya in Sanskrit. So you can see that there is a clear similarity. Actually, the Kachina is simply following the Katantra, but the arrangement is different. In Katantra, we find the stanza, it's a verse, whereas in Kachina, the, it is arranged in, in uh, simple sutras or statements, suttas, aphorisms, and the meter is, is lost, of course. Then it is interesting that the Kachina comment, later commentators, they don't see that and they, they discuss what's the point in stating Samaso before Yuttato. Usually Samaso being the, 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 the technical term that has to be defined in this rule should occupy the last position. But in this case it occupies the middle position. So they are, they are puzzled by that. But if you look at the Katantra, it is clear that it, it is due to metrical reasons only. So one should not overthink it. Now, one important uh, scholar that discussed the relationships between the Kachina and other Indian grammars was uh, Arthur Koch Burnell, who lived in the 19th century, a short but very productive life indeed. And he published uh, an interesting book that I, I would say, at least in my opinion, it's still uh, relevant or at least informative. Uh, on the Ainder School of Sanskrit Grammarians, their place in the Sanskrit and subordinate literature. What is important about this, this very short treatise is that is its thesis, the thesis being that, contrary to the opinion of some scholars, Panini is not or does not represent the oldest grammatical tradition of India. So one should not see Panini as the old, pure grammatical tradition, which was difficult, very technical, very Brahmanical, and um, and, and the rest were simplifications of Panini for the masses, so to say. But on the contrary, what Purnell claims, and I think it is correct, and many scholars also agree with him, there is, there is an older tradition of grammatical thought in India, which is a bit more raw than Panini, it's a bit simpler than Panini, but is older. And this tradition exists before Panini and continues after Panini. So to this tradition that he calls the Aindra uh, school or the Aindra uh, tradition of Sanskrit grammars belong the Katantra and the Pratishakyas and uh, Kachina as well and some grammars written in other Indian languages like the Tamil Tolkapiyam. So if you, if you want to have a, a, uh, a general idea of, of the, the family of grammars to which the Kachina belongs, this is an interesting, an interesting book. And then, before we conclude this section, I think it is important to, to see what is the relationship, if, if there is any relationship, between the Kachina, the Pali grammarian, and the Prakrit grammarians. One thing to be noted here is that most Prakrit grammarians are later than Kachina. Others are undated, so it is very difficult to say whether the Kachina is using uh, grammatical mat uh, materials from, from Prakrit grammars. Another thing is that the, what we call the Prakrit grammarians or the Prakrit grammars were not written in Prakrit except for a few exceptional passages they were written in Sanskrit and they are part of Sanskrit grammars 
so some sanskrit grammars have a section on prakrit grammar so basically we, we could say that it's still it's still uh, sanskrit grammar however there has not been much research on this relationship and i think it is interesting because um, i mean it would be interesting to to do more research on that because there are clearly many similarities between pali and other prakrit or middle indic languages so it is to be expected that the way Prakrit grammarians and Pali grammarians describe some grammatical phenomena are similar. And indeed, you can see, for instance, some similarities uh, between Kachina and, in this case, uh, Markandeya's Prakrita Sarvaswa, which was written in the 17th century, but of course using older materials. And you can see two rules here, Kachina 4 or 6, and the rule from Markandeya's treatise uh, 13, rule 6. And this, this rule provides for exceptions where some sounds might be uh, elided or they can disappear or in some context you might in, uh, insert a sound, an agama, or some sound can change, bikara, etc. Or it can be, or there might be some reciprocal or metathesis uh, replacement, so they exchange positions, the sounds exchange positions, etc. So you can see that there are some similarities between these two rules. Uh, to me, the most important similarity is that basically they, uh, their function is the same, namely to provide for a number, a great number of cases where traditional Sanskrit grammar cannot explain Prakrit or Pali in that case.